All right. Our speaker today, and we're just grateful to have him, is Tom Kelly. Tom Kelly is a noted public speaker. He is the spokesperson for the U.S. Olympic ski and snowboarding teams. He has served on the front line of nine Olympics since 1980, working closely with some of America's greatest Olympic champions throughout their careers. A Wisconsin native, Kelly has lived in Utah since 1988, serving as Vice President of Communications for the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Association in Park City. He is a noted Olympic historian. In addition to his passion for the Olympics, he's an avid skier, photographer, world traveler, jeeper, and scuba diver. He's here with his lovely wife. So let's give Tom Kelly a warm Twilla welcome. Everybody ready to go back to school? Yeah, come on, let's do it. I, I want to start by thanking you for what you do. You have really important jobs uh, in the lives and helping to form the positive lives of young boys and young girls, young men and young, young women. I'm going to talk about elite athletes here today and some of the things that we've done as an organization at the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Association. And a lot of it, I think, is akin to what you do in the classroom here. And whether you are a teacher, coach, an administrator, a secretary, work in maintenance, uh, work on building grounds, all of you play a vital role, each and every one of you. And I hope that that's one of the takeaways that you have here today. I have one of the coolest jobs that I could have ever have met. Every day, I get to work with young men and women who are motivated towards extremely high goals. They've been inspired at some point in their life They've sought help and support to nurture them and move them along. And ultimately, they're looking to achieve some very, very lofty goals. How many of you have been watching the Olympics? Okay. It's amazing. I get glued to the TV. I, I actually I chose not to go to Rio uh, this time. Uh, but it actually is almost better to just sit in front of the TV. And I'm one of those three or four device kind of guys. Uh, I've got you know, one device on uh, swimming, one on aspects one on TV and NBC and consuming as much as I can. I want to start out and show you a uh, hopefully I will. I love this image. This is the image of a gold medalist. It's Josh Christensen from Park City, who in Sochi a couple of years ago won the very first medal ever in his sport of slope style skiing. This is where they go down a slope, they pitch themselves off these huge jumps go on rails, it's a pretty wild and crazy event. But he won the very first gold medal. He led an American sweep, gold, silver, and bronze. When I look at this picture, though, I don't see just one gold medal. I see two, three, four, five gold medals. I see it in the eyes of those young 8, 10, 12-year-old boys walking down Main Street with them, looking up to this young man who's their neighbor, their friend, somebody they see or ride with in Park City Mountain Resort, somebody they know, the kid next door. That's what inspires kids. Now I know we're all watching, uh, actually how many of you were around for the Salt Lake Olympics in 2002, 14 years ago? Wasn't that an amazing experience? To have the world come to our state and to be able to showcase all of our natural resources here in Utah, our Utah hospitality. And it also was a great time to inspire kids. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about kids like Joss, who were 18 years old at that time. They were inspired and went on to become Olympians themselves. But right now, the world is focused on the summer games in Rio. And you know, one of the things in working with athletics, it's really frustrating for me in that lead up to the games when the media doesn't have anything to write about, about except all the bad things that they think are going to happen at the Olympics. And the Olympics come along and the great stories. It's amazing stories of success of athletes and what they're able to do, and what they're able to accomplish. It was a great opening ceremony almost two weeks ago. The raising of the Olympic flag, lighting of the torch. But this picture really sums up to me what the Olympics are about. This is the first day of school. 
This is opening ceremony. This is Michael Phelps bringing in the flag. Everybody is on the same level. No one's accomplished anything at the Olympics yet. No gold medals have been awarded. No results have been issued. Everybody is on the same platform, on the same stage, ready and excited. All the years of work, the support from their families, their friends, their sponsors, all on the line. Big smiles on their faces as they head into the stage. That's what you'll experience next Monday here in Twitter. I want to take a look back, though, and show you a little video. And actually, how many skiers or snowboarders do we have in the group? We've got a few out there. Watch the insane things that these crazy athletes do. But this is a little look at some of our medalists from 2014 in Sochi. Let's take a look. with the best run I've seen him throw down all week long. You know what can motivate you to go and win a gold medal? Seeing your U.S. teammate win one the day before. If she can stop this out, we may see a new leader and a gold medalist. Sean is not stopping though. Oh my goodness. White comes in with heavy contact on the deck. Wow. Caitlin Farrington delivered on that run.
Wow, it's amazing what they do, isn't it? Okay. How many of you have done some of those things accidentally? <laughs> I don't. You know what, as we get into an Olympic period like we are right now, you know, I often think back, why did the Olympics hold such a place in our culture? Everybody who watches the Olympics, it's the most watched sports program, or actually the most watched program on television in America every two years, winter and summer. Billions of people will watch the Olympics around the globe. Why is that? Why is it such a part of our culture? If we think about our world today, we think about what things have maintained their stability over such a long period of time. Very few things, like the Olympics, are the same today as they were all the way back in 776 BC. The Olympics back then, very similar to today. Obviously, the venues were much different, but it was a time when nations would get together. They would come to Olympus. They would compete every four years. Instead of moral, instead of our medals, they had moral wins. But then in 393 AD, the Roman Emperor at the time decided that this was nothing more than a pagan ritual, and they were abolished. And they went away for 1,500 years. Fortunately, historians had kept track of this, and in the 19th century, a number of historians sought to bring back the Olympic Games. And finally, one was successful. A Frenchman by the name of Baron Pierre de Coubertin brought the Olympics back, and in 1896, the first games of the modern Olympics were held in Athens. And there's an interesting story about the very first Olympic champion. He was a young man from America by the name of James Connolly, and at the time, he was a student at Harvard. He was a track star. He'd heard about these Olympics. Obviously, no one knew much about them, but he wanted to go. And he went to his professors at Harvard and said, I would like to take a leave of absence to go and represent my country at the Olympics. And they turned him down. So he left school, and he went over to Athens on a ship along with his teammates. They had a good plan. They were going to get there about 10 days before the Olympics. And the ship came into harbor in Athens. They got out and went in the city. There was a lot of activity. A lot more activity than they would have expected 10 days out from the games. Then they realized the calendar at the time was different in Greece than it was in America. And they were actually there literally the night before the first competition. A little bit different today. But he prepared himself overnight. He went out the next day in the triple jump, and he won what was the first gold medal of the modern Olympic era. And he said, I was the first Olympic victor in more than 1,500 years in a young fellow's life, James Connell, the first Olympic champion. So I want to know what the Olympics mean to you. And I, I, I'll, I'll tell you my first Olympic experience. I think everyone has a first Olympic experience, that time when you were a kid and you are at home and you were inspired by what you saw on television. Maybe you had a friend or a neighbor who was in the Olympics. Mine was in 1960. I was eight years old in Madison, Wisconsin. I'd never seen skiing before, but I was home from school in February, and Mom put the Olympics on CBS on the television. And I saw skiing, and I said, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be involved with in my life. It inspired me, and I still today, I'm doing this, I, my passion is skiing. So let's just do a couple from the audience. What was, what was your first Olympic memory? And just, uh, I can't see it out there too well, so just raise your hand, stand up, and shout it out. Some first Olympic memories. Ice skating. Ice skating, okay. What's that? Gymnastics. Gymnastics. Any particular athlete stories anyone remembers? Mary Lou Retton, Nadia Comaneci, 1980. What do you remember from 1980? Hockey. Okay, here's my trivia question I love here. And, and frankly, most audiences do get this. Who did the U.S. beat for the gold medal in 1980 in Lake Placid in hockey? Finland. Finland! You get an award for that. They beat Russia in the, uh, in the game prior to that to get into the gold medal round. Uh, that was an amazing thing, the miracle on ice. A remarkable Olympics. It was also the Olympics where Eric Heiden, who now is in Park City, uh, was from my hometown of Madison, Wisconsin, won five medals in speed skating, unheard of at the time. 
Any other click on Lincoln's memories? Okay, you all have. And I, I, I know that everybody has these. And the Olympics are different than most other sports. It's about the kid next door. But as with any sport, and the same in your classroom, it's all about seeking excellence. How do you achieve excellence? I want to show you this chart. I love charts. You can make charts say whatever you want, but this one's pretty funny. This is a chart that shows the goal or the, the Olympic medals won by U.S. skiers and snowboarders since 1924, which was the first Winter Olympics. And you can see how it starts to trend up in the mid-90s. That did not happen by accident. It's not a statistical anomaly. It happened because we as an organization decided to come together and say to ourselves, first of all, we can be better. We don't have to just take what we get. We don't have to say our sport is, an, is a European sport, not an American sport. What can we do to differentiate ourselves as the American team? Do things different, do things better. We may not have as much money as the other teams, but how can we be smarter? And the first thing we did is we made a commitment to vision. And that's a pretty important step, and that step doesn't cost you a penny. Commitment to a vision and a goal. And we did the typical thing where you get around the, the room and you've got people throwing out ideas, you put it up on the post-it notes on the wall, you go put stickers on it, and all of a sudden you come up with a vision. Ours was pretty significant. To be best in the world in Olympic skiing and snowboarding. People laughed. The other nations laughed. We laughed a little bit too. But it, we weren't saying we were going to do that. We said, this is what we're aspiring to do. This is our vision. This is what we're seeking. We're not going to accomplish it tomorrow, but everything we do is going to lead up to this vision. You also need to do it with values. And we learned this along the way. You have to stand for something. Your vision is where you're trying to go, but your values represent who you are on that pathway. And that pathway is going to be a lot smoother if you have good values. Ours are up here. Integrity, passion, fun, team, community, excellence, and grit. I love grit. I didn't like it at first, but we added grit a couple of years ago. And I started to think about it after a while. And really, that's what it's all about. If you're going to be successful, you've got to have grit. You've got to be able to get in the trenches and work. You, you can't use excuses. You can't say, I don't have this or I don't have that or somebody else has it better. You've got to have grit. You've got to work your way through you need to have goals. We have five goals as an organization, and everyone who works for us aspires to these goals. And it doesn't matter if their job is working the front desk, managing the building, working in accounting, working as a coach. It doesn't matter. Everyone is responsible for these goals. They're really simple. Achieve excellence. Grow the visibility. Engage, lead, and grow our communities. You can't do it alone. Cultivate excellence and achieve financially sustainable growth. Those are our goals. We built a training center, we call it the Center of Excellence. No one thought we could do this. We went out to the public and we raised the money for this. Last summer, we needed a new training pool at the Utah Olympic Park. We went to the public again. We told them our vision, we told them our values and our goals, and we were able to raise the money. And the end result of it is we went in in 2010 to the Olympics in Vancouver, and we were best in the world. We won 21 medals in skiing and snowboarding, six gold medals. We beat every team in the world. It was a moment of great pride as our vision became a reality. Two years ago, we went to Sochi. We did not achieve best in the world. We were second to Norway. We're still smarting over that. But you know, we did pretty darn well. We won 17 medals and a record eight gold. Now, how do you get there as an athlete? I want to tell you the story of one of our athletes, Shannon Barker. Shannon is a mogul skier. She comes from the Tahoe area. She won the silver medal in mogul skiing in Salt Lake City in 2002 up at Deer Valley. Young skier, total surprise. Uh, made the team uh, through an early qualifier. Uh, no one really knew her, but she went on to win the medal. But her sport is one of the toughest that we deal with. If you are skiers and know what moguls are, those are the big snow bumps. It's punishing to your body. And after two, you know, we got an acknowledgement. <laughs> That's right. I don't ski anymore. So she has a lot of injuries over the course of her career, but she still wanted another medal. No one had ever done that in her sport. No one had come back to win another medal. She did it eight years later. In, the, in, in between, she blew out her knees a couple times, had a few other smaller injuries, 
probably the toughest one is she broke her jaw. And Shannon likes to talk. And I don't know how she made it through that one with her jaw wired shut for about three months. So I asked her after she won that bronze medal in Vancouver. And she won it after qualifying sixth for the finals. And for those of you who may be familiar with judge sports, even though your slate is wiped clean going into the finals for your score, the judges remember where you qualified. And if you qualify first, second, or third, the judges are going to think you're a stronger athlete. So coming out of the sixth position and qualifying to get a medal is pretty extraordinary. But she didn't let that worry her. She had a plan. Her plan was really simple and rudimentary. It started at the top. She wanted to win another Olympic medal. So what does she need to do? She takes it down one notch. Well, she needs to make finals. What do you need to do to make finals? You need to make the Olympic team. And you need to be able to do certain tricks. What do you need to do that? You need to train a certain way. You need to do a certain number of them on snow. You need to do this type of physical conditioning. She just stepped it all the way down to the most minute detail. So she knew she was completely prepared. She wasn't nervous. She wasn't worried. What was going to happen was going to happen. But she was prepared. She said, I had this huge sense of 100% confidence. I looked in the mirror and I believed in who I was because she was prepared. How many of you have ever failed? It's okay. Everyone can put their hands up. We all have failed. Probably the most important component of excellence is failure. Learning from your mistakes, but also having confidence. This is the story of Kelly Clark. Kelly has won three Olympic medals in half-pipe snowboarding. She's been at four Olympics. The worst she finished was fourth in 2006 in Torino. Devastating day for her to miss the medals. This is how her Olympics went in Sochi. In the training round, she crashed every single training round. In qualifying, in three runs, she crashed from two to three. Fortunately, she made finals. These weren't just simple crashes. These were hard, bone jarring crashes. You can look at it. Think of how that feels when you're coming out of a 22 foot half pipe and you're going up another 15 feet in the air. And then you come crashing down on your shoulder in the flat box. It hurts. So, she goes into the finals. She crashes in her first of two finals runs. She's got one more chance left. One more chance to get up to the top and put down a run. She wasn't nervous. She wasn't worried. She was prepared. She didn't let that failure thwart her efforts. And she won that bronze medal. And she said, part of being prepared alleviates the pressure. I knew coming into the night that I had done the work. Success is faithfulness. I worked hard in every way, and I couldn't have been more prepared. It was a huge accomplishment for her to be on that podium behind her teammate, Caitlin Farrington, who took the gold. She didn't let those mistakes bother her. Perseverance. Similar story. This is the story of Nikki Stone. Nikki is the 1998 Olympic freestyle aerials champion. She does really crazy things. These aerialists go up off this jump, they go 65 feet in the air, and they do two or three flips with four or five twists. It's a remarkable event. In 1995, three weeks, three years before the Olympics, Nikki went to a doctor. She had some back problems, and the doctor told her, Nikki, you've got a serious back problem. You are not going to be able to ski again. You're going to have a problem walking. You know, I'm really sorry, but that's kind of the way it is. Nikki did what any good athlete would do. She went and found another doctor. And she found another doctor, another physical therapist. And she went through that, persevering. Because she had a vision for herself. When she was four years old, like many of you with your kids, she watched the Olympics on television. She watched the gymnastics. She watched Mary Lou Retton step up on that podium and get the gold medal. Nikki practiced as a four-year-old. She brought a milk crate in, practiced stepping up on it, having the metal placed around her neck. She was inspired. She was going to be an Olympian. She didn't know what it was going to do yet, but she was going to be an Olympian. And she was going to do what her heroes did and stand up on that podium. So she wasn't going to let this back injury terminate that dream. 
So she found a doctor, she found a physical therapist, and they said, you know, Nikki, we do have a back problem, but we have an idea. We can condition and do some training with you to strengthen the muscles around certain areas of your back. You're going to take some risk, but we think this is a good strategy, and you can go and try for that gold medal. So she worked hard for three years. She persevered, and she won that gold medal on the same day that her teammate, Eric Burgess, won the title in the Nets. And she said, after that, it's okay to have fears, but it's not okay to fear the chance to try. I learned this lesson from my grandmother who said, the brave do not live forever, but the cautious do not live at all. You have to take some risks. You have to persevere. You have to find that solution. That solution is out there. Versatility. How many of you, when you come into the office or into the classroom every day, you have a plan B tucked in your pocket just in case? This is David Wise. David's from uh, Tahoe area. He won the gold medal in Sochi in half pipe skiing. First time that event had been in the Olympics. And he was the favorite coming in. And he had an amazing routine plan. He had tricks that you cannot even imagine. But this is what it looked like the night of his competition. Heavy snow, slowing down the speed in the half pipe. And when the speed's slower in the half pipe, you can't shoot out of it as high, so you can't do as many flips. It's not as safe. A night earlier, Sean White had the same situation, and he failed. He finished fourth. He didn't make adjustments for the weather. I found it interesting. Uh, I don't know if any of you watched the springboard, the, the, the high dive at the Olympics a couple of days ago, and the qualifying had high winds. And they were making a really big deal about these high winds. And I'm thinking, you know, that's every day in our sport. When we go out there, I kind of like it in our sport because it's unpredictable. We have Mother Nature might cancel an event, might create a, an unfair situation. But when Michael Phelps goes into the pool, he knows exactly what the water's going to be like, what the temperature is. It's really pretty constant. And I admire what our athletes do in our sport in battling Mother Nature. So this is the way it is that night. David, after the qualifying round, he goes to his coach and he says, Coach, this is bad for our sport. I can't do my routine. We've got to get this event canceled. And the coach looked at me and he said, David, in about an hour, they're going to be giving away three medals, gold, silver, and bronze. It's up to you if you want to challenge for those medals. So they sat down together in a tent outside the venue, and they mapped out a new run. They threw out all the big tricks couldn't do them. Nobody else could do them either. And they put together a pretty basic, simple run. A little bit embarrassing for him, but the objective was having a plan B to win the Olympic gold. And he won that Olympic gold, and he said, I've had a Sochi run on my mind for a long time that I really wanted to throw down tonight. But you guys are just going to have to wait to see that one. I'm really proud of my sport of free skiing tonight. He headed off to Disneyland, as champions do. Risk management. As I mentioned with Nikki Stone, you have to take chances. This is the story of Ted Ligeti at Sochi, winning his second Olympic gold medal in the giant slalom, or uh, second gold medal the first time in the giant slalom. Now, Ted came into this event heavily favored. The world was watching him. He was the best giant slalom skier in the world. But it's a risky deal. You're going down this course at 50 miles an hour, there are myriad things that can wreak havoc with your run. Now, one of the advantages that Ted had is that as a team, we seek out opportunities, try to separate ourselves from the rest. We actually had forged a partnership with the Russians going into Sochi. So we could get our athletes on the courses the year before to get some additional training. And so Ted, while he didn't know where the gates would be positioned, he knew that hill, and he knew it really, really and in the second run, there was a particular gate where Ted knew he couldn't arc those beautiful giant slalom turns and keep his speed up. If he was going to win the gold medal, he had to take an enormous risk. You don't win gold medals unless you take risks. Think about the girls on the balance beam this week and the floor exercise, the risk that they're taking, the edge that they put themselves on. And that's what Ted did. He said on this turn, he said, I'm not going to arc the turn. I'm going to do a jump turn, a pretty dangerous move. 
the likelihood of going out of the course was significantly high at this point, but he executed it, and he won the gold medal. And he said, this is something I've been working on since I was a little kid. Being the favorite is never easy. It's an event that's far from being guaranteed, and not an event that's simple to win, even if you're seen best in the world. But he took a risk, and he achieved it. You cannot achieve excellence on your own. I don't care who you are, you can't achieve it on your own. You have to have partners. This is the story of the twins, Phil and Steve Mayer, from the 1980s, two of the greatest skiers of all time. At the 1984 Olympics in Sarajevo, on the last day of the men's slalom, Phil won the gold medal, and twin brother Steve won the silver. It was a great day for them. Now, the Mayer brothers were somewhat loners. They trained on their own. They were with the U.S. ski team, but they kind of did their own thing. And it was a little bit about them that day. And when you talk to Phil today, he relives that story from 40 years ago. And it still brings a tear to his eye every time he tells it. And he talks about how, after the race, he was so excited for himself and his brother Steve, and they were looking forward to together, stepping up on that podium and having the medals placed around their neck. It was about them. But when he got up on that podium and the flag started going up, and he looked out into the crowd and the anthem played, his whole life changed. He says, as I heard the anthem and saw the flag being raised, I realized that it wasn't about me at all. It was about all of the people who helped me get there. You don't do this alone. You have to have a partner. You have to have people supporting you. And it took that moment, stepping up on the Olympic podium, for him to realize how important these people were and how much it was about them, as much as it was about him. You have to have a team. Now, in most of what we do in our sport, it's an individual activity. It's one skier in the gate who goes down the course. We're not like football, baseball, and basketball. So, in general, we're an individual sport. But it takes a team to be successful. These are our women's cross-country ski racers from a couple of years ago. They've done very well the last few years as a team. About a half dozen, seven of them, uh, who've had really good results. This was a relay event where they finished on the podium, first time ever. They did it without their star. So the other teams are starting to look at us and say, what are the Americans doing that makes them different? Why are they having success and why do they have this camaraderie? If you look at the girls, they've got this like war paint on. They've got glitter on their face. You don't see this in the photo so much, but they've got these funny stockings on outside of their, their racing suits. And they do this because it builds teams, it builds, builds a bond. And on race morning, they all get together and they truly are in unison. I think this is a real secret weapon of ours. Is that when we go to the Olympics, I see how other teams aren't really as connected as our athletes are. So we had an unusual situation where the French team said to us, we would like to come to one of your camps to learn more about how you work as a team. And we weren't really afraid of that because we knew that to be a team, it has to be organic. You can't call a meeting and say, we're going to work more like a team. You have to all do that on your own. And you have to be able to form that bond with your fellow workers, with your teammates, so you can all be united for the success of the organization. So one of our athletes, Jesse Diggins, a world champion in cross-country skiing, wrote a blog where she really, it, they enjoyed having the French at the camp. I don't know if they learned anything, but they certainly saw this bond that we have. And Jesse wrote, this is not an individual sport. It's a team effort. And it takes a lot of people working together. You need coaches, wax, tech wax technicians, teammates, and supporters. But you also need all of these people to be fully committed to each other. What makes our U.S. team so successful is that every single member is committed to working hard at it. That's what you all need to do. You also need to celebrate success. I enjoyed looking at your trophy case out in the lobby. You have a large district. You have a lot of things going on in this district. And within each of your schools, you have a lot going on. You need to celebrate that success together. This is an image of Ted Ligeti 
after he won the opening World Cup and sold an Austin a couple of years ago. That is a big win for Ted to kick off the season. But in this picture are the coaches, the physical therapists, the CEO, the marketing directors, the team administrator. They're all in this picture because they're all winners that day. It's not just the athlete. It's all the people who help the athlete get there. So when your debate team does well, or your, your band wins an award, your athletic team should celebrate that. You should all celebrate that together. And I guarantee you, when we go to the Olympics, and our freestyle team has success on opening Saturday night, and the snowboarders 20 miles away are watching that on television, I guarantee you that they're inspired. They're inspired by seeing the success of their teammates in a completely different sport. But they're motivated by that, and they're motivated to come in and do that same thing. Elite athletes change their sport. And I, I've been thinking about this a lot during the Olympics, and particularly with Michael Phelps, who totally has changed the sport of swimming over the last decade. I mentioned this to my wife, Carol, and she said, well, what does that really mean? So I started thinking about it a little bit more, and I, I, I thought of Michael Jordan and the impact that he left on basketball. You could look at Mark Spitz and the medals that he won in Munich in swimming so many years ago. Athletes who had really changed the sport. Simone Biles changed her sport this week in winning four gold medals. A 19-year-old who came in was just joyous to see. The interview with Bob Costas last night, where she and Amy Raisman just had a lot of fun. You think she changed her sport? You think there aren't thousands, tens of thousands of young girls across America right now who are aspiring to be just like her? Simone Manuel, the swimmer, first African American to win a gold medal in swimming. What an amazing event. You think this is going to change the sport of swimming? How she will inspire an entire generation of African Americans. And for me, that moment when she touched the wall and she got that gold medal, she was just aghast that she had done this, she'd accomplished this. Not just for herself, but for America. And you've seen both. You know he's from Jamaica. He's a world athlete. What he's done in the last decade to change his sport, people look up to him and they admire him for what he's done. But the real story to me is the story of Michael Phelps. So 12 years ago, during the Salt Lake Olympics, actually, Michael was starting to build his career, but he hadn't won any Olympic medals yet, hadn't been to the Olympics. But he knew that he had some opportunities. And for him, it wasn't just about success for himself. He wanted to change his sport. He wanted to elevate swimming to something at a higher level. He wasn't just going to be satisfied with the people who had come before him and the accomplishments of Mark Spitz, who some of you may remember on the cover of Sports Illustrated with all of those swimming medals. Amazing, huh? Six medals. Michael has 23 gold medals now. You know, he could have been happy with the 18 he had before this year. He wanted to come back and, and, and do it again. But for me, the most important moment in Michael Phelps' career wasn't one of the five gold medals he won in the last week. It was the one he lost. It was the silver medal that he lost to Joe Schooling from Singapore. Joe's a young swimmer. Someone who's a young man looked up to Michael Phelps, was inspired by Michael Phelps. And when Michael Phelps looked across the lane and shook hands with Joe, he was smiling, he was happy. He wasn't disappointed he lost that gold medal because he saw that what he had done had inspired someone to do better. And at the press conference afterwards, he said, Joe should be getting most of the questions here. He just won the gold medal. I'm proud of him. The next generation is all right. Being able to close the door on the sport the way I wanted to that's why I'm happy right now. So he won a lot of gold medals, but his true happiness will come from what he did to change the sport. And I want to leave you with one message in that vein. 
As you seek excellence, you need to look ahead, not back. The goals of today are not the goals of tomorrow. If you want to move forward, you need to look ahead. You need to look at what's been done, and you need to say, how can I do it better? I'll leave you with this last image. It's one of my favorites. These are four kids from Park City, Utah. They were eight years old in 2002. They didn't grow up thinking they were going to be Olympians or Olympic champions. They just went out to see the Olympics with mom and dad and their friends. It was in their hometown. And they were inspired by that. They still wanted Olympians, but they wanted to pursue their sports. So they found people like you to support them, to help them to guide them. And they worked hard. They were motivated by people like you, by coaches. They were motivated by a community, by families, friends, and sponsors. And all four of these young boys grew up to be Olympic champions. They went to public school. They were the kid next door, the kid in the grocery store. They had a whole community that supported them, was proud of them. They all became Olympic champions, and, and they're giving back to this very day. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I hope you have a great school year. It's an exciting time, and enjoy the rest of the Olympics. Thank you very much.